The new museum for the Nevada Historical Society went up at 844 North University Avenue, now Center Street in Reno, just south of the university entrance. After the Historical Society left this museum building in 1927, it served as the student union for the university until just after World War II. Today it's a parking lot. Just as she nurtured the society, Weir also had to care for her mother and sister, who came to live with her. Neither was ever in good health, and both took a lot of her attention. At the same time, Weir was busy in the growing women's suffrage movement in Nevada. She organized the first meeting of the Nevada Equal Franchise Society in 1911 and always urged her female students to realize their proper roles in society and to work for emancipation. Meanwhile, she applied to both Stanford and the University of California, hoping to enter a graduate program dealing with Indians. However, anthropology was not yet a field of study in many American universities, and both Stanford and UC had to turn her down. In 1924, she did receive a doctorate, an honorary one from the University of Nevada. Weir did keep close contact with scholars on both campuses, however, especially Stanford President David Starr Jordan and a young historian, Herbert Bolton, who established the new field of Spanish borderlands history at Berkeley. Later, Weir formed a scholarly association with Professor Alfred Kroiber of the University of California. This proved beneficial for the society when Kroiber shared a portion of the artifacts he had excavated from Lovelock Cave in Pershing County, Nevada. In 1926, however, disaster struck. Despite Weir's protests, the Society's collections were put into the new state building in downtown Reno, on the site of today's Pioneer Center for the Performing Arts. The move, part of the celebrations for the completion of the Transcontinental Highway, effectively removed the collections from her control. Some items were arranged in a gallery display, but Weir complained bitterly of the damage done by untrained hands. Weir's sense of betrayal might be traced to her early days. She was so imbued with her sense of mission that she could not admit any other vision for the society. When her hand-picked board of trustees, even after she had cooked them lunch, would not oppose governor or legislature, she was devastated. The University Archives contains an interesting exchange that sheds some light on this rather odd situation. Weir sent an urgent telegram to Clarence Mackey, son of the silver baron John Mackey, and himself a major benefactor of the university. Mackey wrote to President Walter E. Clark asking for clarification. Although sympathetic to his professor of history, President Clark advised Mackey not to become involved. I never like to pass judgment without being wholly on the inside and knowing all the facts. There may be some facts on Miss Weir's side which I do not know. I had felt quite clear, however, bringing to bear the various things I have learned about this organization during many years, that Miss Weir is now wrong in this matter and is simply characteristically determined to have her way, no difference how mistaken her way may appear to the unanimous present board of control of the society, each of whom was probably originally selected by her to be a member of that board. Finally, in the 1930s, Weir regained control of the collections. With the help of Works Progress Administration employees, she undertook a systematic cataloging of the museum and library collections. Cases were found and materials were arranged into new displays. The library was reestablished. Large-scale collecting was resumed, most notably with U.S. Senator Key Pittman's papers and possessions in 1943, and the purchase by the legislature of 10 Datsolali baskets in 1945. Weir supervised the WPA writers who compiled Nevada, A Guide to the Silver State, and the Society served as a repository for Nevada's war records. Jean Weir died April 13, 1950, not a week after her 80th birthday. Clara Beatty, who had been her student and secretary, took over. The Nevada Historical Society quarterly began publication in 1957. In 1958, the Society remodeled and expanded its facilities. New exhibits and a new library better served the statewide community. Weir would have been pleased, but still hungry for more. She always longed for a substantial, permanent home for her child. Some years earlier, she had asked famed architect Frederick de Longchamp to design a facility. Unfortunately, it was never built. You're watching Exploring Nevada, and today we're celebrating the story of the Nevada Historical Society. Coming up next, Professor Weir's dream finally comes true. Finally, in 1968, the Nevada Historical Society found a home that Jean Elizabeth Weir would have liked. 
here at 1650 North Virginia Street on the University of Nevada campus. Ray Hellman of Reno was the architect. He also built the nearby computer center and the Fleischmann Planetarium. In the following decades, the society staff grew and became professional. The collections grew and were organized. The building itself grew with the addition of a collection storage facility and was also remodeled a number of times. The Nevada Historical Society became part of the new Department of Museums and History after state government reorganized itself in 1979. Another reorganization in 1993 created the Department of Museums, Library and Arts, now Cultural Affairs, with the Society one of seven museums in the Division of Museums and History. Today, the Nevada Historical Society is beginning its second century. Collecting and caring for the heritage of the people of Nevada, the Great Basin and the West, and using that heritage in educational programs still form the key elements of the Society's mission statement. Eventually, a new and larger facility will likely prove necessary. The Gallery and Library of the Nevada Historical Society continue to provide access for community and visitors alike to the most extensive collection of material about Nevada and the West. Jean Elizabeth Weir would be pleased, but she would be demanding more and working hard to achieve more. It is now 100 years since Jean Elizabeth Weir first took a stand for the Nevada Historical Society. Centennial celebrations began with the annual Midwinter Gala in January of 2004, which marked the opening of the exhibition, 100 Years of History in Nevada, the story of the Nevada Historical Society. A range of visitors helped kick off the year-long celebrations. We took the opportunity to find out what the oldest museum in the state has to offer today's residents and visitors. What's your favorite exhibit in this whole place? Well, unequivocally, it would be this 20-mule wagon team, uh, which is from the old Death Valley Borax commercials, I think, in the 50s. What is it that you like so much about this? Well, it isn't the piece itself, but America is so much about advertising. So most Americans who've been around, you know, who are older, somehow if they don't know anything about Nevada, they might say Death Valley, Death Valley days, oh I remember some commercial and so that's why I think this is very significant and will always be a permanent part of the museum. I think it's been here since the museum originally opened. <laughs>